This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi, welcome to the part 2 of the young surgeon complication. In the previous episode we saw that the postcapsular tear happened during the aspiration of the last fragment because there was intense positive pressure and the PC was uh, very close to the phaco probe we have a nice circular opening the surgeon has very wisely introduced ovd before getting the probe out now let us look at the current situation now we have got a pc tear we have got a small lens fragment still inside and can we tell looking at the morphology of the pc tear whether the anterior halo is ruptured or intact so let me give you a moment let me pause here i want you to comment whether there is a vitreous prolapse or not at this stage and if you say so kindly uh, provide an explanation for that okay i hope that you have written down the answers let us look at the morphology of the pc tear now this is the outline of the pc tear at this end we can see a kink appearing there you can see there is an acute bend in the postcapsular tear this is very much suggestive that a vitreous fibril is prolapsing through this end and that is what is causing the kink so you don't have to use a uh, tramsin acetate even before using tramsin acetate you get a clue that the vitreous is already present now so we have a pc tear with the vitreous prolapse and a small fragment there let me pause the video here write down how are you going to manage the situation so we need to deal with the vitreous prolapse we need to deal with the lens fragment and also we need to put the lens now where can you put the lens either in the bag or in the sulcus you plan a strategy how we are going to manage this case so assuming that you have written all let me continue with the case so obviously the first thing to do is vitrectomy we cannot venture to remove that fragment without dealing with the vitreous first because that deserves our primary attention and needs to be dealt with okay now the surgeon has put in some tramsin acetate as well just to identify the vitreous prolapse and this is at the end we can see the vitreous tagging at it now to do bimanual antivitrectomy where should our vitrectomy probe be should it go through the main incision should it go through the side port which side port so always remember it's preferable to have a closed chamber while performing antivitrectomy if we have a leaky wound there is always a risk of more vitreous prolapsing out to the leaky wound so always ensure that we use a closed chamber technique so avoid using the main incision so they call for help and i have been now i am in this or to perform the antivitrectomy and place the lens so i always prefer to go ahead and do a bimanual antivitrectomy with the both the probes in the respective side ports So before introducing the vitrector through the incision you always like to check the functioning of the vitrector this is done by keeping the probe at the wound and then checking whether uh, the it cuts the vitreous or not so we don't want to be surprised of a, a non functioning vitrector after entering into the eye so better to check it at the wound itself and you can always go in and test the cutter outside the eye by placing a little bit of a ovd as well on the wound So once you're certain that the cutter is working now is the time to introduce the cutter into the eye. Now because the chamber is already filled with OVD I am not introducing my irrigation as such now the cutter goes in which is bevel facing posteriorly and the position of the uh, cutter is below the uh, the posterior capsule tear and slowly and surely I begin the cutting and you can see that the prolapsed cut fiber is being pulled back uh, towards the cutter behind the posterior capsule and as i see these corneal folds appear suggesting that the eye is becoming softer this is the time i introduce my irrigation cannula the bottle height is kept as low as possible would put be around 30 to 35 cm just enough to maintain the irrigation so i can see there's a small lens particle which just went behind the uh, poster capsule so hopefully it will just float up and we can emulsify it later cutter is held stationary and the cutting is begun remember that you don't have to move the cutter a lot just be stationary and with the fluid ix itself the surrounding vitreous just come towards the probe and get cuts and aspirated 
slowly i'm just tilting the cutter to a sideways opening position so that i can deal with the uh, vitreous which is prolapsing towards the wound that's the main wound so again you can see that the cutter is held as still as possible we don't want to do any untoward or aggressive movements inside the eye so as the cutter is being done we can still see that the margin of the tear is eccentric and kinked suggesting that there is a vitreous fibril which is running towards the main incision so once i am certain that most of the vitreous around the posterior capsule is uh, taken care of now is the time to deal with the one vitreous fibril which is running towards the main incision so with the second instrument i just try to negotiate that fiber and bring it centrally so that it can be caught and cut with the retractor so as it is being done the lens material which had gone behind just floats up of into the anterior chamber so this is the moment at which i want to pull this out of the eye and it is just flows out through the side port and there's another small fragment uh, near the wound i just depress the main incision so that it comes near the uh, main port so this ensures that both the small fragments have not gone back into the vitreous cavity since the fragment is now held at the main uh, tunnel area and there's no risk of it falling down i go back through the side port incision to deal with that prolapsed vitreous fibril once the prolapsed vitreous fibril is taken care of one can see that the shape of the posterior capsule tear has suddenly changed it has now become very circular just like a rexus because there is no fiber which is tugging at it so once i'm certain that there is no more vitreous it's time to uh, put in some ovd i'm just burping out the small nuclear fragment which was there in the wound now we don't have any nuclear fragments inside the vitreous cavity uh, now is the time to remove the cortex so i'm going to use the bimanual i and a system that is the irrigation aspiration system to do the cortex aspiration of course the setting is in the cortex mode with the vacuum of 200 and a flow rate of 20 slowly but surely each of these uh, cortical fibers are gently aspirated out remember the cortex is dealt with only once the prolapsed vitreous has been dealt with if at all there is any evidence of vitreous present we need to stop the cortex aspiration go back and do the anterior vitrectomy once more the hands are switched and i'm just going to go behind the pupil engage the cortex and then strip it off and aspirate so this process is continued until the all the cortex is aspirated out this is the last chunk of it this last fibril is posing a little bit of a issue there's a reason being it is prolapsed nevertheless i think that the cortex is now totally out now before going in to implant the lens i just want to go ahead and do uh, the vitrectomy a little bit more i just want to be sure that there is no vitreous around the uh, posterior capsule tail just holding the vitrector still and then cutting and aspirating it so it looks like now vitreous is totally taken care of and uh, now is the time to implant the lens the million dollar question now should i go in with a multi piece lens and inject into the sulcus and then achieve an optic capture or can i attempt in the bag posterior chamber lens as well because the posterior capsule tear is such circular and uh, it looks almost like a fantastic uh, posterior capsule rexus i thought in the bag implantation of a single piece lens would be ideal and we have uh, the single piece hydrofolic lens to be implanted in this patient that was the one which was originally planned for and i'm going ahead with the same lens the one disadvantage of this hydrophilic lenses is that they're a little bit more bulkier than the aspheric hydrophobic lenses so nevertheless the space is created within the bag by injecting ovd i want to ensure that the distal haptic or the leading haptic goes into the bag in the first shot itself and it does and as the lens is being implanted i am having a close eye on the posterior capsule tear I'm just watching out whether it will extend because even during IOL implantation the posterior capsule tear can enlarge. So at this stage it looks fine. I'm going in with the dialer to dial the trailing haptic into the bag. Now once both the haptics are in the bag the posterior capsule tear is still very much 
in a circular fashion it has not enlarged and that was a relief for me this is an, a step where it can enlarge so i thought i can go ahead and remove the ovd behind the lens because that is my usual habit uh, leaving the ovd in the vitreous cavity can sometimes cause an inflammation and also pressure spikes for the first few days so as a custom i just go in and remove the ovd especially we have an intact rexus and i thought i had an intact rexus the moment the irrigation cannula goes in and i try to lift the lens i feel that the posterior capsule tear has extended and this was heartbreak i felt that the rexus was so strong that it wouldn't extend but obviously my calculation or assumption was not good enough maybe there was a weak spot in that area which was not very much visible anyway uh, the posterior capsule tear still extended beyond into the equator now at this stage should i leave the lens or should i pull it out and try to do a reverse optic capture okay where is the haptic position that's what we need to understand see the haptic is almost 90 degrees away from the extension of the posterior capsule tear so the area where the haptics are it looks to be quite secure enough so there's a reason why i'm not contemplating any change in the position of the optics so i'm going to keep it just as in place and now is the time to explant the bx device i'm try to remove it under hydro explantation there is a potential disadvantage of trying to remove the bx device under bss as soon as all the flanges have been disengaged you can see that the current of the bss itself is ensuring that the bx device is floating and rotating in the anterior chamber well this is not the safest way to deal with the bx thing so i just come out stop the irrigation inject ovd in the anterior chamber and then pull it out this makes it much more uh, safer so the ovd in front is then irrigated out now we have a stable lens now before closing i'd also like to check for any prolapse which is one last time i'm going to use the dilated transverse state there is no evidence of any prolapsed vitreous that's it the case is done the side ports are hydrated the main incision is hydrated intracamera antibody is a place that's it the case is done these are the first day post op pictures and the patient is doing well okay so what did we learn from this case obviously the first enlightening thing was even when the posterior capsule tear appears to be very circular never assume that it might not enlarge in this case uh, probably there was a weak area in this segment uh, which broke out when there was a slight change in the pressure or when it was touched by the cannula the more debatable question is should we always go in and remove the ovd uh, from the vitreous cavity which has been pumped in well it is debatable you can always leave it but i always prefer to remove it simply because there is a lesser chance of inflammation and uh, post op iop spikes present this is one rare case where in spite of having a posterior capsule tear which looked like a posterior capsule rexus the capsular tear still enlarged So what's the message the message is never take anything for granted now this holds good for an a wise surgeon as well as uh, the most experienced surgeon as well so apart from this we learned the proper way to perform vitrectomy through this case always use snugly fitting side port incisions to perform anterior vitrectomy only in the presence of any retained lens matter we are expected to go through the main incision to burp it out otherwise the majority of the vitrectomy has to be performed through the bimanual closed chamber technique studying the posterior capsule tear morphology itself will give us a clue whether the vitreous is present or not in this case we can see that the posterior capsule tear was eccentric and kinked because the vitreous fibril was prolapsing towards the main incision and the moment that was taken care of you could see the posterior capsule tear shape changes and becomes exactly central and circular so that was it i hope you found this helpful thank you for watching that's it